Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z Flashback, a series of short playthroughs of the 150 games that make up Atari Flashback classics for Nintendo Switch. Today's game is Pool Shark from 1977. This is quite a rare game to come across these days, so it was a real pleasure to see it as part of the Atari Flashback Classics collection. Um, this was one of several games from Atari during the era that was intended to demonstrate the effectiveness of microprocessor-based architecture over and above the transistor-to-transistor -transistor logic that had been used in previous games. Um, and it was the first project of a guy called Michael Olber, who worked at Atari for over 24 years or so. And his uh, programming contributions can be found in an awful lot of Atari games and arcade games and even some stuff to do with the 2600 over the years. And I think the best thing to do is just uh, hear exactly what he had to say on Pool Shark uh, in conversation with AtariCompendium.com in 2017. So he said, this was my very first game assignment. This is a game that I suspect a lot of people wanted to do badly and did. When the Tank 8 hardware came out and allowed so many moving objects, it was time. Or maybe not. We, well, they, had to modify the hardware to display objects that were not basically squares, and that could get close to each other without exploding. Then I also had to come up with the software part of that mod, sorting the balls in horizontal and vertical, and assigning the right logical balls to each physical. Got that part done, we got wrapped around the axle with the physics, or specifically the transcendentals. Okay, mostly Arctan. Management got pissed off at my slow progress and gave the game to another, more experienced programmer who, as far as I can tell, didn't bother to fix anything other than dialing up the surface viscosity, making a game that was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike Pool. So, um, I, I'll level with you, I don't understand half of what he's saying there, but I do get the idea that uh, they were trying to create a, a, a realistic pool simulation, but there were just a few too many limitations at the time. Um, but sort of the chief hurdle that had uh, stood in the way of this kind of simulation beforehand was the number of objects you get on the screen at once. And Pool Shark was one of the first games to have this many moving objects at the same time. So while it isn't a tremendously realistic simulation of the game of pool, as you'll see when we start playing it, um, in the context of the period, it was quite impressive to have that many different things on screen, all moving at the same time. So, without further ado, let's go play Pool Shark. Okay, here we are with Pool Shark. Uh, let's just jump right in. Starting one player. Now, unlike a lot of later... Uh, pool simulations. In this game, uh, you don't control the cue or anything, you just control the cue ball. And you just move it around and hopefully try and get all the balls in the pockets. And that's literally all you have to do in this game. But it's surprisingly difficult. So, as we said in the introduction, sort of the... Um, the key unique selling point of this, if you like, was the fact it had this many things moving around on screen at the same time. Which was quite remarkable for the time, when you consider some of the other stuff that was happening. Usually the most you'd have is sort of maybe one or two objects, and they might be firing things at each other. They might be firing some shots at each other. But this many large objects, particularly large objects that um, aren't squares, yeah, that was quite remarkable at the time. Now, um, as, the, as the designer said, this game doesn't really bear much of a resemblance to the actual game of pool, and so you don't need to follow any of the rules or anything like that. All you're trying to do is just knock all of the balls into the pockets. That's literally it. So you don't have to worry about the order, you don't have to worry about patterns, you don't have to worry about spots and stripes, you don't have to worry about potting the eight ball last, you just have to knock them all into the pockets. And if I remember correctly, I've only done it once, um, and inevitably it won't happen on camera. Um, <laughs> I, I think you get a bonus when you manage to um, actually pop the entire rack. Um, and that maybe allows you to keep going for another frame, possibly? I can't remember. Anyway, we'll see how we do. I do actually quite like this game, because although it's incredibly simple and kind of dumb... Um, there's something oddly addictive about it. This is a great handheld game, in fact. If you're um, if you're playing um, the Nintendo Switch version as we're doing here, then this is a fantastic one to have available to play in handheld mode. I'm just going to shut the curtains, if you excuse me a sec, just so we don't get blasted with light and I don't uh, turn into a cloud of dust. Right, let's try again. 
But yes, I must confess, I have already whiled away many hours on the toilet with this game in particular. The Atari Flashback Classics Collection in general is very good for toilet play, I might add, because uh, because of the very nature of both arcade games and Atari 2600 games, um, they're designed for short play sessions. Um, even if you're someone who poops for as long as I do, um, yeah, you can kind of keep your play session under control with some... Um, Built-in time limits, shall we say. So so this is a time-limited game. You have three uh, racks of balls and a time limit for each one. Oh, 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 I did it. Excellent. Bonus. Yeah, so you, you basically get another free attempt when you do that um, to score some more points. So if you can keep clearing screens and you can keep racking up the points. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do this in five seconds, am I? No, clearly not. Oh, well, not a bad score at all. All right, rack two. But yes, as I was saying, because uh, of the inherently kind of limited nature of arcade games, the fact that they were designed to have a high turnover of players uh, means that they're good for handheld play quick sessions, whether you're on the toilet or just waiting for a bus or whatever. Those are always the two examples people give, aren't they? On the toilet or waiting for a bus. There's, there's other things you could do, like a particularly boring meeting at work. Although, if you... Uh, yeah, you have to be fairly surreptitious about... Um, having your Nintendo Switch out. Just pretend it's a tablet or something. A tablet with brightly coloured controllers on either side of it. No one will ever know. Just take care not to bellow too many expletives at it. I suppose it works fine for conference calls. If you're on a particularly boring conference call and you're not paying attention like I normally don't, um, then, yeah, just whip out your Switch and have a quick game of pool chuck. You'll be surprised quite how oddly compelling this game is so like i say it's it's simple it's dumb and there's really not a ton to say about it but uh i really like it <laughs> and he's right it does bear a passing resemblance to pool but is almost entirely unlike the actual game of pool but uh that doesn't matter that doesn't matter for my money the thing i like about computer games is the fact that they can adapt stuff like pool and add stuff to it that isn't possible in reality that's the thing i like about games even when they're sort of trying to do something vaguely like a sport or a board game or something like that the thing that distinguishes an electronic version from just playing it on the tabletop is the fact that electronics allow you to explore kind of fantasy scenarios they allow you to do things that would be impossible in reality. So, like, you couldn't play pool like this in reality because there's no way that you can directly control the cue ball like this. Yes, you can shove it around with your hand or something like that, but that brings in its own, own considerations. You have things like your body weight on the table. Um, you have your, your arms and legs getting in the way. Whereas in this, you're just literally moving the cue ball around and knocking things into... Well, it's hopefully the appropriate places. And getting that nice, satisfying little whoop noise when it happens. I love that sound. Certain certain sound effects from this early period of Atari games I really love. And that whoop is one of them, definitely. Absolutely. In you go, Nightball. Yeah, I, I find it quite amusing how variable the performance is in this. Like, when when you've got all the balls on screen at the beginning... They all move pretty slowly, like that. But as soon as some of them stop moving, you notice the whole thing accelerates considerably. And it's not just a case of a better frame rate. It's like the whole game speeds up. And so you kids complaining about games not supporting your 120 hertz monitors properly these days. This is the shit we used to have to deal with. So just be grateful when your game works at all. <laughs> Yeah, I've been really pleased to uh, explore some of these really, really early Atari games throughout the Atari Flashback Classics collection because um, with the age I am, I'm, I'm 38, I was born in 1981, my first encounter with Atari was with the Atari 8-bit computer, so I kind of missed out on... Well, I just missed out on sort of the, the early era of uh, Atari games, arcade games, 
uh, the 2600 and so on, because I was I was born just a couple of years before the 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 great video game crash of 1983, and so I wasn't really old enough to appreciate computer and video games until I was a little bit older, until after that had happened. So a lot of these early black and white games and 2600 games and so on, they'd already been and gone by the time that I was actively getting involved with this sort of thing. So it's been really interesting for me to explore this part of history that was just before just before I was getting into um, gaming for myself. And discovering that there's some really fun, if very simplistic, experiences to be had among those games. So as I say, Pool Shark here has become a real favourite. I really like Canyon Bomber as well that we looked uh, at a while back. Um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, at the time of recording, I had um, some slightly belated birthday celebrations. And what I've enjoyed doing for my birthday for the last few years is uh, having some friends over to play a variety of games from over the years. I like to take them on a little journey through time um, through a series of games. And a significant part of that is always playing some old Atari games. Uh, because they're they're so sort of personally important to me, like Atari in general is is kind of a defining part of my childhood. So I always make a point of putting some Atari games in there, and um, a lot of these old simple games proved to be some of the most popular. Like like Canyon Bomber was a big hit. I didn't expect it to be quite such a big hit, but as we talked about in the original Canyon Bomber video, that game is so so addictive. Despite having the simplest mechanics it's possible to have, you have one button to drop bombs, and that is it. So it's all about timing. Nothing more than timing. But yeah, that game is a massive hit amongst the group. And uh, I was really pleased about that. We didn't actually play this one, uh, but I have a feeling that this would have been uh, quite well received as well. All right, let's play one more, one more round. And let's make it a good one. He says, not knocking any of them into the pockets. Oh dear. We might have to have one more after this, because this is this is disastrous. Oh, come on. Seriously. I'm honestly not doing this deliberately. <laughs> one. There we go. Finally. Oh, come on. Yeah, this is a real disaster. Yeah, I don't understand um, what the uh, the designer was going on about with the physics, but uh, you can you can sort of feel while you're playing this that yeah, there there is something. Oops, you can pocket the white ball. <laughs> there is something slightly off with the physics at times. Like sometimes the balls just don't quite go where you expect them to, uh, particularly if there's kind of a sequence of balls um, hitting each other. Although, if you look at it, it's actually a surprisingly convincing job, given the limitations of the hardware from the era. So, I don't think people give enough credit to the the way that physics were modelled in early games. Like, Pong handled things in a really interesting way by dividing the paddle up into discrete segments. And so, you didn't put spin on the ball, as you do in, in certain later block breakers, um, like Arkanoid and so on, but it's all to do with where the... Uh, the ball collided with the paddle. And I think something similar is going on here because there's no way of sort of adjusting how quickly you're moving. There's obviously no way of actually putting spin on these balls and it's all to do with where the white ball collides with one of the black balls. But the interesting thing about this compared with Pong is that um, we're not dealing with squares. So in Pong, the ball was a tiny square. So it was just, just a pixel, basically. In this... It, the balls are all made up of numerous pixels. They're all circular. And so I can imagine at the time that would have made calculating the physics considerably more complicated. Right, one, 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 one more try. Just because that first rack last time was so disastrous. Right, let's do a bit better this time. That's already a better start. Lovely stuff. I'll tell you one thing, I'm better at this game than I am at real pool. I am bad at real pool. I was, um, growing up I was dyspraxic. Uh, and so I had a bit of difficulty with, with certain physical things. I, I always found it quite tricky to do things like sort of line up the queue and just hit the ball in pool sometimes. But, um, 
that's kind of lessened a bit over time, although I'm still very clumsy. But, um, yeah, because this game doesn't really resemble the game of pool, it's, uh, I can do, I can do a lot better in it than I can with real pool, which is nice. Right. Come on, you lot. In you go. I feel like this is the kind of game that could have probably been reskinned with all sorts of things. Like I, I, I could imagine this sort of being reskinned with like a sheepdog and a herd of sheep as well. That would have been quite fun. And people would have lapped up that sort of thing at the time just because... Although there were a lot of clones of things around at the time, people people were just eager to play new games. People were just eager to, to try new things. And there was still the novelty value of things. And while video games were still spreading and growing in popularity... Um, yeah, it was entirely possible that you might come across a clone first um, before you came across the original. Whereas these days, we're all very, very familiar with sort of the originators of certain genres and types of game and that sort of thing. We all know how much the the App Store and Google Play is full of shameless clones of games and so on. And yet, people still kind of accept it these days, which is kind of saddening to see sometimes. But... Uh, Anyway, there we go. That's probably a, a discussion for another day. Anyway, that is Pool Shark from 1977 by Atari. Um, for me, a game I really like in the Atari Flashback Classics collection. So if you've never played it before, be sure to give it a shot. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects, MoeGamer.net, where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today, and VideoPackGames.wordpress.com, which aims to catalogue the small but well formed library of the Philips G7000 Video Pack Computer, also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.